this is Rich Outfield. And And we're picking up on this conversation, the 3D, Star Wars, re-release, special effects conversation that we had that that just multiplied like – what are things that multiply? Your Calculators. Calculate. Wait, no. Oh, hey, that's clever. Let's see what he did there. I was thinking of tribbles or rabbits or or anklaviches, and he thought of calculators. That's ah. Uh, okay, so I, think let, I used that simile in a story once, but no one ever read it. No, no one ever will. But that's okay. Someday I will learn to write a good story. Why do I feel so guilty? It. Wait, wait, what? And then they will read it. See, see, there you go. Oh, you, you're a good writer. And in fact, at some point during this episode, I have a feeling that I will refer to that. I, I will compliment you on your writing. I doubt it. Oh. Okay. So, off we go. Way up on my list of movies that I love. Drop Dead Fred? Exactly. Wow. Somehow. Jack. Jack with Robin Robert Williams and Williams. Diane Lane? Uh, no, not, not no. so much. Actually, I, I liked Jack the first time I saw it. Freddy Got Fingered? Oh, even I have to draw the line. <laughs> Captain Picard has to draw the line here and no further. Back to the Future is one of my absolute okay. favorite films and is being re-released in theaters in, in 2D, 2D. Oh. at the end of October. And so by the time this episode airs, that will have happened already. Mm-hmm. But, dude, when I heard that, I thought that was the greatest thing. And it's only at AMC chain theaters, which they have all over L.A., but here I don't think there are. I don't are think any. we have one around here. I know, and that bums me out because I love Back to the Future. And the reason it's coming out, I guess it came out on the 25th, 26th of October, uh, which is the day that Marty McFly did his historic journey back. You know, he's like, today, October 26th, 1985, I'm about to make an historic journey. When he goes forward in time, where does he go to? 2015? Right. Uh, so we'll have hoverboards it. in five years. They need to release it again on that day. I would love to be able to see that again. It's, uh, I'm sure it's just digital projection, so it doesn't cost them anything to make uh-huh. prints and all that. And that's something we've talked about for years. Ever since they invented the digital projector, we were saying, well, now it's going to be easy to re-release movies. Do it for all the time. And since we're recording this before the fact, I have no idea if it made a dime. Chances are no. The Grease re-release didn't make any money doesn't need to, though. I mean, you can re-release a film for a day for one showing if you wanted to. And then often they do. And I get, I'm get i behind that. To me, that's an event. That yeah. is much more worthy than releasing something in 3D. Mm-hmm. The, I some, agree. Releasing something old in 3D. I totally agree. Um, to just be able to grab your kids and say, hey, you've never seen this movie. Let's go see it in the theater rather than just renting yeah, it or Netflix. Yeah, take your kids to see it. Wizard of Oz or something like that in the theater would be Wouldn't awesome. Wouldn't that be an event? Wouldn't that be an exciting family outing? I would think That's something so. Something that you'd never forget. When, when you and I were in college, our local theater started doing these midnight revival shows. And I was able to take my little sister to see Raiders of the Lost Ark. Uh, I think Gremlins, uh, there was a re-release. There was obviously Princess Bride. The, 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 the best they, little whorehouse in Texas. The, the best little whorehouse, yes. Uh, and I was able to take her. And this was the first time she'd seen any of these movies. And when they re-released the Star Wars films in 97, despite the atrocities that they committed <laughs> against those movies, that was still an event. And it yeah. was still... And, and I wish that they did what they did with Back to the Future and just re-released these movies in the theater just so that you could appreciate just you and I I mean you'd take it an afternoon off work to go be able to see Empire if it was the only time you'd ever be able to see it like that well not ever but you know what I'm saying it's just yeah. a the, the way these movies were meant to be seen and being there in a dark theater, you're forced to look at it. You're forced, except for the bitch next to you that's texting through the whole thing. You've got no distractions. You're, you're stuck. You're watching. You're, you're feeling the movie. You're noticing things that you'd never noticed before because the rest of the time it's on TV and you're ironing and you're folding your underwear and you're grading papers and you're, you're doing all these other things at the same time. You're and, cooking your lunch and you're taking a dump in the other room. And Wait, what? <laughs> Yeah, at eating least. your lunch and then dumping it straight out the other side because you've got intestinal problems. <laughs> Sorry. I just thought of a guy eating as fast as he can on the toilet. He's like, oh, ah. and just that's I'm so just hungry, but revolting. it keeps coming out the other end too fast. Oh, that's terrible. Hunger will never go away. Okay, so this brings us full circle, though. 
the that Star Wars. Full circle. <laughs> that no, is the, it the circular in t- eating? In t- that's right. We all everybody <laughs> wants to see the human centipede on the big screen. Yeah, I know your kids were bugging you to take them to that. The Star Wars films are being re-released, but they're being re-released in numerical order. Oh, so 2012 we get the Phantom Menace being re-released. And the next year we get to episode two, and the next year we get Revenge of the Sith. And the next year... We get Revenge of the Nerds. When I'm 126 years old, Star Wars will finally hit the big screen again. But by that time, they'll have actually given up. They won't even make it because the other two didn't make any money. The other three. Uh, Now, see, you know this. You are able to see this. Having heard (laughs) this news today... (laughs) <laughs> Why does Lucasfilm not realize this? You release them in chronological order. I think that still counts as numerical order. You need to say... No, no, no. Chronological. Release, 1977, 1980, 1980, 1983. So actual chronological order, not story chronological oh, order. Okay, I guess I hear you. you re- in release order. That's, that's a better way to say it. You release them in that order and everybody's going to go see Star Wars again. Although I hope that he hasn't burned a lot of... Br- I'm sure he has... Because the diehard fans are all in agreement that the original versions are better and that every time he messes with it, it, it infuriates. That's a word I've just made up Ooh. that only applies to the Star Wars trilogy. Making something inferior and infuriating all those that Ooh. liked it. It infuriates it. I like that. Nigel <laughs> Star- Oh, Nigel doesn't listen to this dang. I think this one is back to just John Smith from 223 Crescent Circle. Wow, you still remember that guy's address. He took his life almost two and a half years ago. And you still... I, I'm sure there's a whole new family living there. Too I, bad they moved into the house where we've got the permanent piped-in Dune Steve podcast. <laughs> <laughs> They'll probably be taking their life soon as well. They're better off. I would love them to re-release the original Star Wars, you know, have it be a weekend only or have it be a week or have it be monthly. And I would go again and again. When you said that Lucas was after more money, that's a good point. But just like making a new ad at in 2010, there is a demand for this. I want it. You want it. I am willing to give George Lucas more of my money as long as... He fulfills certain standards as long as he fill in the blank. He makes a Millennium Falcon toy that's better than the one that you have. You'll buy the new one. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. And and as long as... Except for that, I wouldn't buy the new one, but yeah. (sighs) Why? Why do you have to ruin? It just depends on who you are is all I'm saying. But go on. I've given George Lucas so much of my money. (laughs) And when Star Wars died in 86, 87, around that time, I was so depressed about that. I was a kid and I realized that all my allowance and all the stuff I'd given and, and, and what did I have to show for it? Just a room full of boxed up Star Wars stuff. But then a few years passed and the nostalgia kicked in and I loved it more than ever. And I was fine with that. I've given him so much money over the years But as long as he makes product that I want, or as long as he's able to capitalize on the nostalgia and not ruin it, I'm willing to give him more money. So if they had the option, also available in 2D, also available in the 1977 version. Wow, wouldn't that be great? It's like we were saying with the DVDs. You know, give everybody the the chance. If they want the version with the digital do-backs, that's cool. But if they don't, let them choose that version. Yeah, speaking along those lines, you were talking earlier today when you mentioned this news to me originally, and I said, hey, what about that one, you know, they have that cartoon they made of Star Wars, but they also had announced that they were going to make a live action TV series. And I asked you what happened to that, and you're like, ah, it's dead. They say that they can't do it for the amount of money that it, it would be too cost prohibitive. And I just thought, what in the hell? Is it just because... George Lucas has got to have a thousand digital do-backs in the background. Can he not just make a set and use the set and put people in costumes instead of making everything CG Jar Jars bouncing around? Why is a TV series of Star Wars cost prohibitive, whereas they can make endless Star Treks? They can make Battlestar Galactica, which was really well made and even had some CG shots in it week to week. Makes me angry. Gets my goat. Well, good, because you're on the right show. And and I don't have an answer for you on that. 
was there too much CG in those prequels? Totally. Hell yes. Yeah, that's the problem is that he's like, oh yeah, we can't make it because I can't rent a green screen every week for the amount of money that I have for the budget. Rent. I don't understand that either, the whole budget thing. And it's possible that that show wouldn't have been any good because Lucas has lost sight of yeah, what made those original films so good. Probably. And the love that I had, and I, wait, you love Chewie too, huh? I love Chewie. The love that we had for a big guy in a furry costume or the love we had for a Muppet or the love we had for every single one of these characters for a, a dwarf in a tin can – so that, 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 that is something the hard work earned, earnestness, good acting, good writing, a great score and all this stuff. It's just – you asked me about Star Trek today. It's like did you ever get sick of just some guy with a prosthetic on his forehead calling himself an alien? And the answer is no because that was a human being doing a performance under right. that. And it doesn't matter you know, if he's a good enough actor or has good enough lines – you don't care that that's just a guy with silly contact lenses on or whatever saying that he's an alien. And just I think a guy that's with something that George Lucas has forgotten haircut. is the, the low budgetness of Star Trek. They had no money. That was low budget even in 1966. It's not like, well, those special effects have really dated. They were bad then. <laughs> but they worked hard on that show and the writing was so good and people loved that show then and they love it now. And it didn't matter about the, the kick-ass special effects and all that stuff. And when I see something like Alice in Wonderland where there's just so much unnecessary CG and it's like, why isn't that just a guy? I think, am I insane? Am I the only one in this theater that gets that? You could have saved $20 million by just having people do that. And Lucas takes that to the nth degree where every single shot has to have myriad things to draw your attention and things going... <laughs> Over here in the corner and Three Stooges stuff going on with the battle droids. And you could make a Star Wars centric TV series with almost no money. A bunch of college students that loved it could do it with what you got on your Mac right now. <laughs> True. The abomination that is the Star Wars holiday special. Somebody could have made that awesome with the exact same money, which was none, that they spent on it. Because they loved it, because they were willing to sweat and put in a little bit of work better than the four-armed Harvey Korman. I, just B. Arthur is one of the best moments in that film because she seems to get that there's supposed to be emotion in this terrible song that she has to sing. I see that and I think of what a huge wasted opportunity that was. That so they got Mark Hamill and Harrison Ford and Carrie Fisher and Peter Mayhew and James Earl friggin' Jones to do the holiday special and it's crap. Wow, dude. I, I, oh. yeah, and, and, and see, this is the anger that I, that I should feel all the time on this show. Uh -huh. I could, in a weekend, take that holiday special script and make it into something better because I love every one of those characters and that world and just the chance to see all these people again. And the fact that they wasted it because it was a cheap cash-in, ultra yeah. cheap cash-in. And it's just like, ooh, ooh, here we go. And even Lucas is ashamed of that. So that <laughs> makes you think, wow. Yeah, he's not ashamed of the things he's done since, but somehow he's ashamed of that. They're making a Star Wars sitcom, are they not? Have you heard about that? I've heard Seth about Green it. Seth Green is supposed to be... That's just like the Family Guy right. thing but you it's know, where they just got the license. And, well, it's, I was about to say it's going to be crap. But I don't know. Maybe those guys, Matthew Senrick and, love and, stuff, that's and for sure. Seth Green, love it enough to put in a little bit of heart and not to just go for the cheap cash in. Basically, you can stamp Star Wars on a bucket of and it will sell. As long it's as you call it Wookiee Nuggets. <laughs> it's because you and I and our entire generation loved those movies so much that it was life-changing, that it's changed the way that we think and see movies. And it's not just my generation, but the generation before mine and the generation after mine. And Lucas continues to cash in on that because there seems to be a bottomless pit of goodwill. People like me who have been talking for three hours <laughs> about – the crappiness of the prequels and all this stuff, and yet I still said I'm willing to give more money to Lucas. That's delusion. That's insanity. That <laughs> I, I should be strapped down and, and put in a room where, where there's no sharp corners. That's the effect that those movies had on my generation, on me as a little boy. And if somebody 
put that same kind of love that I have and that you have for Star Wars into a TV series and frankly kept it away from George Lucas, <laughs> that TV series would be great. It would. And Battlestar it Galactica need. was a terrible show, dude. It was a terrible show that only got on the air because Star Wars was popular and it had come out a couple years before. And Glenn Larson, I'm not saying he was a hack or anything like that. Oh, it was awful. But Ron Moore and David Icke, I think is his name, these guys put real passion and real thought and real heart into the remake, into the reimagining of Battlestar Galactica in the 21st century. And that show, when it was good, was great. You know what I mean? And I, I do. And that's something that we've said countless times. I don't know if we've ever said it on this show, but if you care enough, you can make anything, any premise into a good movie. You can make anything scary in a horror movie if you care enough to think of a way. You can take any idea, you know, that shitty looking Smurfs movie that Roger Gosnell is doing for next year. If somebody loved the Smurfs, like, the way that Ron Moore loved Battlestar Galactica or loved what he had created for Battlestar Galactica, that would be a movie where you're like, holy cow, I'm going to buy that. Yeah, I like the Smurfs. I mean, it, it actually makes me upset to see. I mean, it's not like the Smurfs were the most wonderful thing from my childhood either. But I see that and I go, oh, crap, there's another bit of my childhood that's being raped and destroyed and okay. pissed all over. Well, see, I didn't realize that. I don't feel that I way I don't the love the Smurfs, but seeing one more thing go down the crapper as they've done with everything else, it upsets me. It makes me sad. Okay, well, here's a good example. You loved... Thundercats. And I friggin' hate Thundercats. <laughs> I didn't... I, oh, oh, hold on. I'm going somewhere with this. <laughs> okay. Oh, gosh. You used to have Snarf as like your little nickname on the internet. And every time I saw that, I would be reminded that you liked Thundercats. <laughs> but you're a talented writer. And if you channeled that love that you had for Thundercats into a all CG or live action or whatever, a new reimagined Thundercats series, I have no doubt that it would be good. Uh -huh. That even I, who friggin' oh, hates, hates Thundercats, <laughs> would like it. Do you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Remember the Titans came out. Uh -huh. And I fucking hate football. I hate it, dude. The way that you hate child murder. <laughs> and I was blown away and moved by that Remember the Titans movie because they put passion and heart and good acting and talent and work into a movie about football. And I was like, wow, I want to play football and I want to be black. <laughs> I'm just saying if you care about something and you work at it, that piece of crap Marmaduke movie that they came out with this last summer, if that was a writer who wanted to prove himself no, and sorry. really poured talent in. Sorry, you've gone too far. Marmaduke <laughs> has stepped too far. You've lost all credibility and all our audience. They've turned it off now. When you said Marmaduke, that was it. <laughs> But I want to be a screenwriter. I wanted to write movies. That's what I wanted to do with my life. I, uh -huh. I, I now, you know, I just want it to end. But for a long time, I wanted to do that with my life. And if somebody handed me Marmaduke, the property, and said, well, that movie with the funny-nosed guy didn't do so well in 2010, but uh, we're going to do a cheap direct-to-video sequel, <laughs> and we want you to write it. I know that if I spend a couple of nights without any sleep, and just put all of my heart into it, knowing that this is going to be my one chance to break into movies. I, and you know what? Maybe I have no talent. Talent has something to do with it. Yeah, there is it's not just it. heart. But I know that if I poured all of my heart into it, you could make something that few people would see. But maybe there's kids that liked the first Marmaduke and forced their parents to buy it for them because nobody rents anymore. And and you <laughs> walk in Redbox? and your snot-nosed brats are all watching Marmaduke 3D on the 3D television because you bought that too. And you watch 15 minutes of it and go, wow, that was kind of – I actually felt something for that terrible CG dog. I have no doubt that that can happen. That's my point. It's you can make anything scary and you can make anything into a good movie if you care. And that's the thing with how many people actually care. I don't know who wrote Marmaduke, but I am assuming that those were screenwriters that have done three or four, five, ten movies already and they're just doing it for the paycheck. And they're already thinking of the next project. And it's a ka-ching. And it's done and we move on. Which I think brings us back to George Lucas. And the milking of the Star Wars property. And the milking yeah. of the Indiana Jones property. And, and I'm, I'm surprised that we haven't seen six Howard the Duck movies. If that first movie had made a dime, <laughs> I guess that's what would have happened. 
But I know that if he handed it to people who cared, if he had handed those prequels to somebody who actually could screenwrite or understood how a movie is made or cared about anything other than bottom line and selling action figures and Halloween costumes and, and Pepsi with Princess Amidala's face on it, uh, uh, Queen Amidala. Weird. I've started to forget the prequels already that those movies would mean yeah. something that when in 2012 they're re-releasing them in 3D people would be lined up like, for we've it. we've got to go and see it. But so that's not what they were. I hear George they're, Lucas is actually making a THX 1139. <laughs> cashing in on one more property somebody with heart and talent could make that work <laughs> they could make that into American a movie where i actually too. care about any of the characters or what's going on in the screen and and that's a perfect george lucas movie there's no humanity in that film there's nothing <laughs> tangible or or memorable what keeps us going as the human race um and and maybe that was his intention with that movie, but it doesn't explain how he continues to do it. It's too bad because like the Smurfs, but to a much, much, much greater extent, Star Wars is the thing that inspired us the most as children. I mean, that's probably as much for you as it is for me, the reason you went into film school to begin with, because you saw that film and it captured your imagination and kept you wanting to do that same thing when you were a kid. And, yeah, to see it continually brought further and further down, it's just hard to deal with. Well, on that depressing note, maybe we will call this Yeah, we probably should. I don't know how many episodes I'm going to cut this into. Probably three. But it was intended to just be one episode and a quickie at that. <laughs> and I've said it on the show before. And if we continue to do That Gets My Goat, I'll, I'll say it again. But, yeah, I could do a, a podcast just dedicated to Star Wars. I love the characters and the music and the setting and the world and all that stuff so much. And I'm constantly noticing new things that I've never noticed before or hearing about a deleted scene or something that almost happened or an interview with somebody that was on the set that I've never heard before. And it's just more amazing to me, more, more, more great to me. And I guess that there are kids that love Anakin and Obi-Wan and Qui-Gon and there probably are. And then these characters may like nearly as much um, or more. I don't know. But something tells me that they'll see this at 13 or 15 or, or something and suddenly go, Oh yeah, it will fade. And there, there were movies that I liked as a little boy. And you told me about gremlins that you really dug gremlins as a kid. And then when you saw it yeah, as an old, old man. A lot of said, movies Ooh. from the 80s that were that way where I've liked them and so I got them to share with my kids and then I watched them. Oh, it wasn't as good as I thought. Never Ending Story was probably by far the worst of those. I thought that was great as a kid. And then when I watched as an adult, oh my gosh, was that terrible. Did we talk about that on an episode? Because it seems like at some point we I have. said, sing the song. <laughs> and you did but I don't even remember that airing I don't know if it was on an episode or not but yeah never ending story <laughs> oh, that wasn't a cue to sing oh, the song no oh, singing a never ending story I have no zero negative one nostalgia for a never ending story but I guess if I had seen it a little younger or a little older or seen it with a like a 13-year-old girl that was just developing as a woman and she let me touch her. The Maybe younger, I would better. feel something about that. But I, I, I just don't. And yeah. I remember the first time I saw it, I was already too old for it. And it was just like, oh, Yeah, man. it's really bad. But at the same time, I felt that about Tron. Mm -hmm. And people are so excited about this Tron sequel. And part of me is just like, <laughs> you dumb bastards. But... You know, if whoever made Tron 2 loved the original. There you go. And they're putting in heart and love and Olivia Wilde and, and brand new special effects and stuff. Bring it on. Let this movie be good. It may well be. There, we need more good movies. Yes, we do. Okay, we're, we're ending. Okay, so this is the end of our episode and the end of our lives. <laughs> Can I just say this is the first time I've ever been on television? Oh, I'm sorry. There's no time. All right. Good night, folks. Good night. That Gets My Goat is produced under a Creative Commons 3.0 license. <laughs>